Hey you guys, Becca here. And as promised, today I'm bringing you guys a quick education on a rigid endoscope. Now, to understand a rigid endoscope, let's break it down to the Greek meaning of the word. So if we break down that word, I don't know if you guys remember taking Greek and Latin roots in your schooling, but if we break down the word into two segments, we look at endo, and that means within or inner. We break down the word scope, that's to see. So the very most basic way to think of an endoscope is to see within. In our facilities, we have what's called a rigid endoscope, which can be classified as a cystoscope, a hysteroscope, a laparoscope, an arthroscope, a sinuscope, and it would be any rigid scope, meaning that it has the hard tubing that is used to see with inside the body. Then we also have a flexible endoscope, flexible cystoscope, flexible ureteroscope, scopes used in gastroenterology, whether that's an EGD scope, whether that's an ERCP scope, whether that's a colonoscope, you get the idea. These are the scopes used to see inside the body. Today, I'm not gonna be talking about flexible scopes. I'm gonna keep my focus point on rigid endoscopes. So, how are they used? What I love sharing with you guys is the things I didn't know when I worked in sterile processing. So, a bit of my history for those of you that don't know me, I worked in sterile processing for seven years and I am now in a sales role and I have done that for a little over six years now. So in terms of my timeline and working within an operating room or a sterile processing environment, we're over 13 years at this point. So what I like to educate you guys on are some of the things I did not know. So I'm gonna walk you through the rigid endoscope. The anatomy, maybe some things to look for, how it's used, and then I'm gonna blow your mind, mind blow, with an analogy. Because for me, I'm very visual, and if I can think of a rigid endoscope and put it in perspective, thinking of it as something else, it makes it much more simple. Because we all know in our industry, there are so many parts, so many IFUs, so many devices and so many things to understand that sometimes we need to break it down to the most basic of concepts. So today I'm covering the rigid endoscope, scope used to see within the body. As I said, there's many different kinds. There's many different diameters of these scopes. They can be very small needle scopes. They can be a four millimeter, 30 degree arthroscope. So the lumen size, would be the millimeters and the degrees are the field of view at the distal tip of the scope. So like this scope, for example, is a zero degree. Then there's 30 degree, then there's 70 degree. And the degree at which the physician uses it is the field of view that he needs to see. So it depends on the procedure and how this device is being used intraoperatively to decide what type of rigid endoscope the physician is gonna use. Now, I feel that sometimes this term is used loosely in our profession, rigid endoscope. And that's why I explain that a rigid endoscope is not just a laparoscope. It can be the arthroscope, hysteroscope, cystoscope, each with different uses for a different type of procedure, but all the same in nature of their helping us see inside the body. So something I didn't know. A lot of times you'll have a set that goes up to surgery and it's a lap cam cord and scopes. That's one set. So there's a couple scopes in it, usually a zero and a 30 degree. And then there's a camera and then there's a cord. All I knew when I worked in sterile processing is that's just what goes in the set, right? That's it. So I'm gonna make sure the inventory is there. But, but how are these components all used together? I'm gonna give you a quick visual here. We have the eyepiece on your rigid endoscope, your camera, your little alligator, your camera has a coupler on it and that coupler releases. It has a little spring in it or if you're working with 
different kinds. They have a rotating coupler. Basically the coupler opens and closes and that alligators onto your scope. Okay, we've got the camera hooked onto the eyepiece, which then magnifies all of the visuals going through this scope. Then we have the light cord. The light cord goes onto the light guide post. Usually there's an adapter for the fiber optic cable to appropriately hook onto the light guide post. That fiber optic cable is exactly how it sounds. Tons of tiny hair like fibers run the length of a cord to give light. And I always want to laugh and say, the Lord said, let that be light. That's what we're working with here. So we've got an image, we've got light, we've got the avenue to transmit that image. The camera and the cord are hooked in to the console. Okay, those two are hooked in, everything is turned on. And then we have a screen, nice big screen. And this is what your physician is looking at. So when looking at a rigid endoscope, you have to think that whatever visual you have, when you look through the scope is then magnified to be much larger. So we ask why is it important to assess for damage? Because what we see with our naked eye is then magnified for a physician in a procedure. And I had a doc ask one time where I asked him, you know, I look at a lot of these scopes and I want to have a clear understanding of what level of damage is an acceptable amount of damage, right? Because these things get beat up, especially if we're talking about an arthroscope. These things get beat up in the operating room. There's ways to avoid that, but that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about how this works, what it looks like, and the basic anatomy. So, they get really beat up and I asked this doc, I said, doc, Dr. Kerr, how much damage is acceptable? Like how much optical relay damage, optical relay being the system that delivers the image down and out of your skull is an acceptable level of damage because this comes out as looking like little black dots on the screen. Maybe you guys have seen it when you've been assessing your scopes to be sent up, they have a bunch of little black dots those are broken fiber optics within your scope. And he said, Becca, can you tell me how acceptable is it if I miss one millimeter of your cancer? Ooh. All right, I'm done talking. I'm out. Okay, point well taken, sir. So it's very important that your physicians have a great image. And I feel like I want to go like, dun, dun, dun. So here's my analogy. We're looking at a rigid endoscope and I want you to think of it like an eyeball. Think of the anatomy of an eye and I want you to think right here of the optic nerve as your light guide post. I'm, I broke this anatomy down in an image which I will share with you guys in the comments and in another post so that you can think of your rigid endoscope a little bit differently. But let's think of the optic nerve going through here and we have our blood vessels and our units that then relay the image. So we can think of this as our light fibers going through the light guide post here and you can see this on an actual scope how the fibers are then housed in this control body here and then they run down the scope. So think of it as the nerve. This is what's relaying down the optical relay system your visuals, your light. And then in the scope, we have spacers and then glass rod lenses. Spacers, glass rod lenses. And then, I don't know how well you can see this, but there's an outer shaft, which you're seeing right here. And then there's an inner shaft of the scope, which is a little bit thinner of a metal. So outer, inner. Same as looking at the eye. If we think of it, we have an outer layer and we have an inner layer, okay? And I like to think of all of the vessels running through the scope, just like, if we're gonna put this right here, as your lens rods and spacers. And then we get to the distal tip of your scope, right here. So housed right behind the distal tip 
is an objective lens assembly, and that consists of multiple items. I'm not going to go through all of it, but there's a prism assembly, there's a negative lens, and there's items in here, just like if we look at the outside of your eye, there's a cornea, there's the pupil, there's the lens of your eye. Think of the distal tip of your scope a lot the same way. There's multiple components housed right behind this distal tip that are necessary to create a great image for your physician. So in the comments below, you guys, and in another post, I'm gonna break down how I change the body basics of the eye to the body basics of a rigid endoscope. I hope this was helpful for you guys. There's many ways that you can check these. I will very quickly go through them. When I check a scope, I check top to bottom, eyepiece, any dents, any dings. I look at the control body, we good. Then when we've got the light guide post, what I'm going to do is make sure that the light is working. Take your scope, hold it up to light. Any source of light, whether that's in the ceiling, whether that's your light of magnification, and right here in the light guide post, this should be fully illuminated. It should all be the color of light. If it's not, there are broken fibers. And so it will come out as little black dots right here on the scope. Okay, so we got eyepiece, we got light guide post to make sure the light's working. And then you need to run your hand down the scope. Is there any damage to the tubing? Because that can mean there's damage to the internal components of this device as well. This I most commonly see happen with cystoscopes that are used with other instruments that the scope goes inside of for evaluation. And lastly, the distal tip of the scope. I want you guys to use lighted magnification. You know those little things at your workstation that never get used? Yeah, those. Turn it on. Use the magnification and check it out now, right? We've got all the different components going on, which I will break down for you guys in the image that I'm going to share with you. Make sure that there are no chips in the glass, the objective lens here, and that there's no physical damage to it, meaning this is not abrasive because you can't polish out metal that's been shaved off the end of the scope. Doesn't matter how much you try and polish, my friends. It won't work. That's where you have to get these devices repaired. I'm not here to sell you, so I'm not going to talk about a repair process or anything along those lines at this point. This is me simply sharing what I have learned about these devices over the years and getting an understanding of what the heck is going on. Because frankly, it's pretty darn cool to see inside of these, to understand. Lastly, the thing you have to think about is, as I said earlier, the diameters of these scopes are different. So that means the size around the scope is different. This is a 10 millimeter scope, so it's pretty beefy. We can get down to needle scopes used in neurology, and those are very, very skinny. ENT sinus scopes, even tinier. So what happens when the diameter of the scope gets smaller, it's more fine. You will find that this is less rigid and the size of the glass in those little tiny needle scopes and sinus scopes is so small and so easily damaged. So what can you do? You can be more careful. This is not me talking about care and handling. This is me explaining to you the components so that you can use some more care. I say think of a set as a car. If you've got two scopes, a camera and a cord, it's probably worth pretty close to what your car is worth. And so handle these items with love and care because they really just aren't so rigid as they're said. They're housed with multiple components that are very delicate. I hope you guys found this helpful. Happy to write an article as well to break this all down if that's more helpful to you. I did write an article a long time ago, but it's time for a refresh because as we all know, this industry is ever evolving and ever changing. 
So while this is a basic piece of surgical equipment, as my knowledge increases, so does my ability to share this knowledge with you in an effective way. So the content I put out two years ago, I'm slowly working to revise that to be more impactful for you guys so that I can educate you and bring you knowledge. That's my only, only goal. Bring you knowledge that affects patient safety in a positive way. Basic device knowledge. No rocket science, no craziness. Just, hey, here are the devices you're using. Here's how they're used in surgery. And here's maybe some things to look out for. It's it. It's that simple. I hope you all have the best day. We'll talk soon. Bye.